Good afternoon, good day to everyone. Uh, welcome to the next session in uh, Mitte, which is actually where I am right now, uh, in Mitte in Berlin. Uh, I have the uh, privilege of introducing our next speaker, and I will put on my best uh, Swedish pronunciation uh, for Kenneth Frantien, uh, who is, yeah, not bad, okay. Uh, and he's going to uh, talk with us uh, today about how to infect and indoctrinate today's youth in the ways of free and open source software. Uh, he has some experience in this field, being a teacher, I believe, in high school in, in Sweden. Um, so secondary education. Uh, so looking forward to hearing about uh, how our next generation can continue in our footsteps. Off to you, Kenneth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I hope you've all been enjoying the conference so far. I, I've been at least. Some really interesting ideas flowing out there. And I'm glad to see you all here now. I hope you will at least find some interesting discussion points uh, out of all the things I will uh, talk to you about, the material I will br bring forth. But, but firstly, the question on everyone's lips, who am I and what right do I have to uh, have an opinion? <laughs> well, uh, Kenneth Francien is my name, as you heard, and I work as a web development teacher. So. I, and I worked as a web developer before, but now I mainly teach, uh, and it's on the west coast of Sweden. And my students, they can become anything from software engineers to web developers or network technicians. And uh, you might have heard my voice before, perhaps. I've been on a few podcasts like uh, Hacker Public Radio or All in IT Radio, or maybe not. Well, the thing about youth, I mean, we are in the open source community, the free and open source community, we have sort of built in this idea of propagating our beliefs. And uh, we like to talk about what we're interested in. We, we enjoy spreading the word, as it were, uh, about what we do and why we do it. And somehow we often get our kids, if we are old enough to have kids, or perhaps uh, our acquaintances involved in some way or another. Uh, and that is true even though the thing that we are talking about is somewhat, I shouldn't say inherently boring, but <laughs> I mean, we, we are talking about code and licensing of code here. It isn't the most spectacular and most interesting of fields, however you look at it. But it is a very effective way to produce and govern software. And that is something we have discovered and that is something we believe in. So uh, as a teacher, I, uh, I have sort of a, a responsibility to, to give this knowledge to uh, others. Right, I should have switched the uh, image here. The image you see here is from a Drupal camp in Gothenburg where I live. And you can find me on this picture if you look at the lower left part in a Firefox t-shirt behind a balloon. <laughs> that is me. And the one actually who posted this picture is the man on the top left, Adam Evertson, who, who uh, got this conference together. Uh, Drupal camp and Drupal is, as I guess many of you know, uh, a CMS content management system, which is very popular. It's uh, one of the greatest ones, uh, most used ones after, of course, uh, number one, which is uh, WordPress. So I've been involved in, in uh, such conferences as well. And I try to take in when I have older pupils, students, I try to bring them to these conferences if possible. And 
it, it is a good way to make them see and make them appreciate that what I say isn't the only voice that says this. Because when you are in a classroom situation, it 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 sort of becomes the teacher saying something and the pupils, the students listening and shrugging, just thinking that, yeah, well, that's what he says. <laughs> and of course, that is not how education should be. We, we, me and my colleagues, we try all the time to integrate our education with uh, conference uh, talks like this one to show the pupils, show the students that we are um, a part of a global movement and there are a lot of people that actually think this is important. All right, but still it's not easy to reach students. Uh, they are in sort of a troublesome position. They are surrounded by a lot of people and a lot of organizations that is not really interested in free and open source software. And if we just give an eye to what sort of uh, companies they are surrounded by, well, we have this famous uh, example, Microsoft, who went from saying that Linux is a cancer and open source software is communism and a threat to society, uh, under Steve Ballmer uh, as CEO of Microsoft, to what we hear now recently, where as well the CEO of Microsoft, but now Satya Nadella says that we are all in on open source. So they have made a change. They have made an image change and uh, an idea change, which is mainly governed by their need to embrace open source or go under, to be, be totally frank, because they are seeing themselves more and more as a cloud company, as does many other companies. Uh, the internet has really changed the way that companies reach their customers. So being a cloud company, you cannot ignore open source because FOSS is what built the internet. It's what it's built on. And no matter how you think about it, you can't escape that. But even though a large company like Microsoft can uh, have these uh, ideas and intentions, which so far seems well meant, uh, and they actually do contribute to the FOSS community today, which is very nice to see, but, but still, that is something that occurs on a plane on, and on a, a horizon which my students never reach or never see. It doesn't affect them because the software that runs in these clouds and the software that they run isn't really in any way or form um, affected by this. I mean, if they buy a new Xbox, <laughs> what does that say about free and open source? I'm certain there are some uh, free and open source uh, in the Xbox, and there probably are some documentation that uh, resides the GPL somewhere. But the 14-year-old who is playing on that game system probably doesn't know or, or care either. So uh, this is what the companies they are surrounded by are alike. And we have a situation where, well, it's the law of the le of, of least resistance. I mean, Adobe, Adobe Photoshop is equivalent to editing pictures, but it shouldn't have to be. Uh, and a, a large part of that is not only that Adobe is good at making uh, themselves known in the public, but also that the alternatives are not known by those who should teach the alternatives. 
So students, they know what the latest, coolest, most expensive things are, and they want them. They want to be cool in the eyes of their peers. And who, who doesn't, <laughs> really? OK, so, so that is the corporate side of things, what actually influences students that way. But what does the government think? How does the government uh, approach free and open source software in relation to education in Sweden? Well, there are things being said from time to time. In the latest uh, 10 years, there have popped up thoughts and ideas about uh, implementing more FOSS in uh, the way that uh, the country is governed and how the schools operate. And we have a couple of, couple of quotes here on screen. Uh, you see they started an organization, the government started an organization which had uh, in part the mandate to strive for public administration as far as possible to build its solutions on open standards use open source software, and so on. So, so that has actually been written from the government on official paper. And, uh, well, stuff happened with that organization, but uh, th that is uh, neither here nor there. And if you read the instructions given by the government for uh, the secondary uh, educational system in Sweden, it says actually what you see in the second quote here, that the school should be open to different ideas and encourage their expression. It should emphasize the importance of forming personal views and provide opportunities for doing this. It is also a strong, you can find strong wording for uh, democracy and uh, ethical thinking, ethical reflections about how, what, what you learn as a student, how that uh, affects the rest of the country and the rest of the world, our fellow human beings. And in that, sure, it's not really directly related to free and open source, but still, in that you can find the idea of FOSS actually quite snugly uh, making its place. And especially since, since we have sort of the situation where it's not even mentioned at all. So it absolutely, it, it, there is room for free and open source. Uh, and if I just mention quickly about how the Swedish educational system is uh, built, the, if you are somewhat involved in education anywhere in the world, you probably recognize a few of these um, ideas and, and the way this is organized. But the main thing for you to, to take from this is that you have compulsory school that is uh, nine years, and that is from ages seven to 15. And then you have upper secondary school, which isn't compulsory, but most actually do continue to study, and that is 16 to 19 years of age. And after that, you go on to university or, or some other higher vocational education. And that could be, I mean, two years to become a network technician or three years to become a network engineer or, or anything in there between. So I am situated in the middle of this uh, map in upper secondary school. In Sweden, it's called gymnasiet, and it's uh, actually a name derived from a gymnasium, uh, but it's uh, the original meaning of the word. So up under secondary school, ages, say, 16 to 19, uh, that is, the late teens students are um, discovering the world in a way that they haven't done earlier in their education. And these three years, they have the possibility to choose what kind of education they want. So we have uh, 20, 30, whatever, 
how many there are uh, programs or, or uh, education that they can choose between. And uh, I, I teach on one of, of those uh, programs. So I, I'm uh, teaching mainly, as I mentioned, web development. All right, so the government has made it possible to teach about free and open source in the upper secondary school. There are room for that, and there are possibilities to talk about it if you look at uh, stuff like um, uh, the, the curriculum for the individual courses. But it is the munip municipalities that actually are behind and sponsor and take care of the, these schools. So we have 290 municipalities in Sweden who try to do their best. And each municipality buy their own software. And that is software from the cloud, like uh, if we talk about student platforms, learning platforms, but also what computers should be bought and what software should be on them. So that isn't the best <laughs> idea because you don't have the competence in most municipalities to do uh, um, to, to find good software. Rather, you hear something from uh, your friend on the golf course from the next municipality over, and then you go with what he says. So we are, have been stuck with a lot of bad software through the years. And a lot of the reason for that is that the municipalities doesn't have the competence, as the scientist mentions in the quote here uh, that I found in a magazine just last week. Teachers are, if, if it's like herding cats to <laughs> administer programmers, well, it's like herding kittens. I don't know what's worse, actually because teachers are so set in their ways. Uh, uh, 10 years ago, we d uh, made a, an, we tried to implement open office at our school. And the idea was that, well, we have a lot of money to save uh, going from Microsoft Office. And they actually, went as far as rolling out open office on all the pupils' computers, but not on the teachers' computers. Why? Well, because a handful of teachers had some Excel sheets with uh, some sort of programming in them that they had used for 10 years, and uh, they would never, under any circumstances, uh, be able to translate that to open office. And since they didn't have the same functionality and the differences that uh, Microsoft implemented, there were so many problems with the, the students and the teachers not having the same software that the next year they rolled out Microsoft Office again. But it's not hopeless. I, I mean, we had the pandemic now and from one day to the other, almost all teachers seamlessly went over to teaching their courses via Zoom or Teams or, or whatever, with the kids being home. And so there is a possibility for uh, change, but it's hard to see what makes it possible. So how do, how, do, how do we, in this environment, approach this then? Well, the, um, we, the, these are two of my closest colleagues on the screen. And we talk a lot about how to get these students who have never even thought about licensing before, how to get them to understand uh, FOSS in a good way. And the first year when they arrive, we don't get in, in touch with them that much because neither one of us have any courses with the first years, unfortunately. 
but uh, the library uh, at our school does a good job of introducing Creative Commons to them. So the library visits uh, all the classes in year one and they explain how Creative Commons works and how, do you, how you find works that are released under such a license. So that, that is a first taste of it. And then in the second year, that then they come to me and, uh, and study the course of Web Development 1 and uh, also a, a, base, uh, a primary basic uh, uh, computer course, like uh, this is a screen, this is a processor, this is, a com this is what makes up a computer, uh, etc. And then we really try to give them as much as they can handle from the start. So we actually begin with how to become a hacker by uh, ESR and talk about the hacker ethos and, and what's what what started and what was the foundation for what later become the the FOSS movement and this idea that you shouldn't reinvent the wheel and and it's always better if we actually collaborate to create software and which has been proven by now, you would think that it is actually a better way to produce software. And this we introduced them to, as well as great examples of software being developed that way, like, like uh, Inkscape and GIMP, uh, VirtualBox, 7-Zip. We talk a bit about Linux, uh, as well as the CSS uh, framework bootstrap. But then we really dive into it in, in the third year, uh, where we talk about Drupal, of course. Uh, we uh, uh, give them uh, the chance to try out Docker, the LAMP stack, Git. And as they get in contact with software and they get in contact with software that others have built in this way, well, it's still not easy, but they start to see and start to understand why it is important and what the benefits are. But then to say that they actually become FOSS enthusiasts, well, no, no, not at all. Perhaps one in 30 become an enthusiast and enters the free and open source community. But uh, otherwise, I, I would say, um, how, uh, the main student body, they listen uh, and uh, puts it away somewhere in their mind, and, and then it's not important anymore. The big problem for us as teachers, I think, is to make it not seem hard. To set up Docker and uh, a LAMP stack and Drupal virtual container and start collaborating with code on Git, GitHub or, or similar. I mean, for us, it's easy because Drupal, I mean, sorry, Docker is simpler than Vagrant was, and Vagrant was much better than what we had before, and so on. But for them, coming to this from nowhere, not really understanding virtualization, neither full virtualization or container virtualization, they struggle. And it's hard for me to make sure that their struggle doesn't leave them with a bad taste in their mouths regarding Drupal or FOSS, when the problem is perhaps that they should have, the problem lies in the infrastructure, I think. And perhaps we are trying to teach them too much. Perhaps we are too enthusiastic. Perhaps we shouldn't give them uh, the Docker treatment, but uh, a, a already made container uh, in Kubernetes or, or equivalent and just let them build there. But it is still a part of what 
we are supposed to teach them. They are supposed to learn about these stuff, these things. And if they go out to a company and search for a job, which they can do after the three years with us, they will find companies that work with these technologies all the time. I have acquaintances in, in the uh, FOSS community and in the web development community, and uh, we have visited them at their companies and, and we asked about what kind of stacks they use, what kind of software they use. And we really try to use the same things when we educate our uh, students. So the biggest problems, the, the biggest uh, thresholds we have to pass to get the growing generation to understand and accept FOSS is obscurity as, a, as it ever has been, as it has been for since forever. They simply don't know it exists or why they should care. And the other is that it sort of is moving out of reach into the cloud and that way they never get in contact with it. Or that teachers and municipalities in Sweden, at least, and I guess it's the same in most of Europe, simply doesn't have the knowledge needed to leave the safe bosom of Microsoft and Adobe uh, and introduce the alternatives. And also that not all the software is as polished as it perhaps could be to make the transition as easy as possible for the students. That is what I've noticed and I've, what I've identified. Uh, shall we take some questions perhaps? Thank you very much. Thank you, Kenneth. Uh, that was a very interesting talk. I, I have two kids myself, and so I'm always curious about how, in German public school, uh, so I'm always curious about how this is done in other places. We certainly have our fair share of similar problems, it sounds like, uh, especially when it comes to dealing with uh, teachers with laptops and you know matching software with, with students and funding and networking and high-speed internet. And yes, it seems like seems like it's a common problem. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are no questions that are coming up uh, no. just yet, um, but I actually have a question um, for you. Based on the years that you've been doing this, have you seen kids come back later and say like, hey, I, I really, this was really useful for me and in what context was it useful for them? Um, or did they find that like it took them a lot longer to understand the fundamentals so that they could get a grasp of why FOSS is important. Yes, yes, absolutely. I have met students that perhaps five years later realize that, wait a minute, what Kenneth taught me actually is something I, I find useful now. And it actually is what people use and how this, uh, um, how it works in, in the real life, so to speak, that they didn't really make the connection when I was teaching them, but later when they went out, got a job and, and so forth, they found that this is really how it works and this has really helped me. And, and we also, we have students who stay for a fourth year uh, and they go out to a company and works there as a part of the curriculum. And they always come back and, and tell us how much more they know than even the people at the company, because we are in the forefront of what we teach and what which corresponds with what companies actually need. That's that sounds great. That's really uh, I mean it's impressive to see uh, to see all of that coming back to you. Um, so there are a couple of questions that have come up as well. Um, so one of them is from your personal experience. Um, was it that catches the interest of young people for FOSS? So you mentioned one in 30 was enthusiastic. Yeah. I guess in another way maybe is like of the other students or of that for that enthusiast, 
like what is it in particular about FOSS that sort of like really clicks for them? I mean, it, it, it's never, it is not a GPL. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, what they actually go for is they discover vector graphics and Inkscape and realize how empowering that is when they start to draw and create or, or Blender or, or one of these softwares that are a really good example of FOSS. It, it's the software that draws them in. And it doesn't have to be much. Uh, I mean, some only discovers Linux and, and, and find that this does suit me much better. And as soon as they appreciate the software, whatever it is, the appreciation of FOSS comes with it. And then they start to, in a small way, evangelize and, and discover other pieces of software that helps them uh, move forward. Yeah, OK. Um, so one other question is, um, what do you feel open source projects could do to uh, make their projects more interesting and accessible to younger contributors? Uh, and if there's anything uh, in particular to be aware of regarding safeguarding, uh, I, I guess, for young minds, let's say. I love the things that uh, Canonical has done. I don't know if they do it anymore, but, but when, when they pick bite-sized bugs to fix, mm. e even if it's the documentation uh, that, I, I mean, it, it, of course, every project should, should focus on their software, but uh, also have a look at the instructions for that software to make it simple and easy to understand regardless of age, because that's not that difficult. Uh, to, to uh, make sure that the video uh, snippets that explain one or, or other functionality is easy to understand for everyone. And also to include students and people who are trying to learn programming or, or trying to uh, get into the community, to give them these small ways to help and, and to contribute. I think that is very important. OK, so also contributions in terms of bug reports and yeah. improvements to documentation, stuff like that. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and in terms of safeguarding, uh, and in terms of, of safeguarding, I mean, keeping things in mind that these are you know, 16 to 19 year olds, you know, should should projects consider like a special section of documentation for a younger audience? Or is there anything in, else in mind that you would like open source projects to be doing in that sense? I feel that that would put a, too great a strain on the project. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I think. And I, I, these are students that are surprisingly mature in the way that they handle technology. They aren't uh, strangers to reading manuals and such. I mean, they have grown up with it in a way that we haven't. <laughs> So I think that to make them a special place, no, it's not necessary. Okay. Uh, but uh, of course, it's better to put that uh, work and that time into making sure that the ordinary documentation and, and the ordinary um, visible places of, of the project is as polished as can be. Yeah, makes sense. OK. Uh, so someone was asking, thinking more about, uh, regarding that question about uh, uh, the last one, was thinking more about child safety, so working one-on-one -on -one with adults from around the world fully digitally. So let's say they're, they're collaborating with someone and, you know, someone asked to do a video chat or something like this, mm. so keeping in mind that there are youth. Um, any ideas? So has this has this ever happened? Um, any, any ideas for maybe ways to, to safeguard kids? We have been blessed in not having that problem. And a part of that is that since they only start learning programming year two, they are not there until year three. And that's when they turn 18. Mm -hmm. OK. So and then the rules are a bit different. And it's sort of, well, it's more or less their own responsibility 
right. of course we, we always try to warn them about the problems that can exist yeah do you find that at that age when kids are coming in uh they already have some experience understanding by their from their other teachers or from their parents how you know how to be safe on the internet is this sort of a, a common well-known uh common knowledge or is it still i'm curious as well for myself what do i have to do to prepare my kids <laughs> Ten years ago, well, uh, I started teaching 12 years ago, but 10 years ago, I had a class where a 17-year-old girl, were, she had her own blog, and she was uh, frequently posting uh, pictures of herself in a bikini and mm. scantily clad. And uh, I, took up, I took this as an example in class <laughs> to, to make them see that you don't know who, who's watching this. Yeah. And I don't feel that any one of my students would do that today. So something has changed these, this last decade. And I think that the educational system has caught up now. And I at least hope that it is because they have been probably warned. 